1945. The Second World War is nearing its end. The bloodiest and most devastating war in history. The victorious Russian and American armies meet at the Elbe River and dance on the grave of Hitler's Third Reich. The Red Army now occupies part of Germany and most of Eastern Europe. VE Day, victory in Europe. After two world wars in 30 years, the survivors pray that this time, peace will bring a return to the tranquility of an earlier age. But the war has transformed the face of the globe forever. And in the decades ahead, the world will undergo another transformation, as great as that caused by World War II. It will be a long and difficult journey. February 1945, President Roosevelt journeys to Yalta to meet with Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. They discuss the fate of Europe when Germany is defeated. Stalin promises to participate in the formation of a new world organization, the United Nations. Roosevelt is convinced that maintaining the unity of the wartime allies is essential to the future peace of the world. On July 16th, the United States explodes the first atomic bomb at Alamogordo, New Mexico. Less than a month later, similar bombs will be dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, ending the war with Japan. It is the beginning of the nuclear age. July 17th, President Truman goes to Potsdam for the last summit meeting of the Allied powers. There's not one piece of territory or one thing of a monetary nature that we want out of this war. We want peace and prosperity for the world as a whole. Truman seeks to carry on Roosevelt's policy of cooperation with the Soviet Union, but he does not trust Soviet intentions in Europe. Stalin sees Central and Eastern Europe as a buffer zone essential to Russian security. He insists on establishing pro-Soviet governments there. The United States and Britain demand that the governments be chosen by free elections, as stated in the Yalta Agreement. But they soon discover they have little influence over events in areas under Soviet control. By the following year, east-west tension has spread to the eastern Mediterranean. There already have been crises in Iran and Turkey. Now civil war breaks out in Greece between the pro-Western Greek government and communist guerrillas. Historians will argue the origins of the Cold War, but to President Truman and his advisors, the situation seems clear. They believe that only firm and dramatic action will avoid another European disaster. They are, as Dean Acheson puts it later, present at the creation of the post-war world. They decide on a policy of containment, of preventing the spread of communist governments to nations not under communist control. The free peoples of the world look to us for support in maintaining their freedom. We must take immediate and resolute action. I therefore ask the Congress to provide authority for assistance to Greece and Turkey in the amount of $400 million for the period ending June 30th, 1948. In Western Europe, the post-war economic crisis threatens political stability. Poverty and hunger lead to demonstrations and violence in the streets. There's no doubt whatever in my mind. 
Secretary of State Marshall, proposes a massive program of economic assistance, provided the European countries can agree on a common program. Senator Arthur Vandenberg, a former isolationist, takes the lead in creating bipartisan support for the Marshall Plan and for a Senate resolution favoring collective measures for Western security. By 1948, communists have seized power in Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, and Poland. In February, they take over in Czechoslovakia as well. Within weeks, the non-communist foreign minister, Jan Masaryk, dies mysteriously in a fall from his apartment window. Officially, his death is ruled a suicide, but many in the West doubt it. June. Stalin institutes a blockade of West Berlin, trying to force the Western powers to abandon the city. West Berlin is without fuel and faces starvation. The British and Americans respond with an airlift which many consider impossible. By October, their planes are bringing 4,000 tons of food and fuel to West Berlin each day. This remarkable feat avoids a military confrontation and eventually forces Stalin to end the blockade. 1949, the United States joins a peacetime military alliance for the first time in its history, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. General Dwight D. Eisenhower returns to Europe to become supreme commander of the NATO forces and begins the slow process of rebuilding the West's military strength. In the years ahead, NATO is to prove a powerful deterrent to military aggression. And by 1952, the Marshall Plan also has accomplished what it set out to do. The industrial and agricultural capacity of Western Europe has not only been restored, but exceeds pre-war levels. Only 60% of the $17 billion originally estimated is spent. But growing stability in Europe is matched by increased violence in Asia. In China, civil war follows in the wake of World War II. In 1949, Chinese Communist leader Mao Zedong launches an all-out assault to bring down Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist government. American efforts to mediate the conflict have failed, and Chiang's defeated forces finally abandon the mainland for the island of Taiwan. In Congress, the reaction is swift and angry. Truman and Secretaries of State Marshall and Acheson are blamed for what is called the loss of China. News that the Russians now have the atomic bomb increases the sense of crisis, as do a series of sensational spy cases. One communist on the faculty of one university is one communist too many. Senator Joseph McCarthy launches a campaign against alleged communists in the U.S. government, which lasts for four years. One communist among the American advisors at Yalta was one communist too many. And even, even if there were only one communist in the State Department, even if there were only one communist in the State Department, that would still be one communist too many. June 25th, 1950. North Korean forces cross the 38th parallel and invade South Korea. Truman sends American troops to aid the South Koreans. And they soon become part of a United Nations army there, under the command of General Douglas MacArthur. The UN forces occupy most of North Korea. But as they approach the Manchurian border, Chinese troops enter the battle. The war reaches a virtual stalemate near the original border, where fighting continues for two more years. On July 27, 1953, an armistice is signed. Some say it is peace without victory. Others argue that the war has served its purpose, that communist aggression has been stopped. The armistice in Korea does not bring peace to Asia. In Indochina, France attempts to re-establish its colonial rule. The French are opposed by the Viet Minh, a communist-dominated movement. The United States decides to support the French. Victory eludes the French army, and in 1954, they suffer a disastrous defeat 
at Dien Bien Phu. Within months, Secretary of State Dulles organizes the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. It is one of a series of alliances and treaties negotiated by Dulles to make the doctrine of containment global. In the aftermath of the Marshall Plan, the United States now is conducting a new kind of foreign aid program. Aid not for destroyed industrial nations, but for developing countries with limited knowledge of modern technology. Many are just emerging from colonial status. American aid seeks to lay the foundations for industrial and agricultural growth. It is motivated both by the humanitarian ideals of the American people and Cold War rivalries. Throughout the 1950s, the Cold War goes on. After Stalin's death, there is hope for a change. But it fades when Soviet forces suppress a revolution in Hungary. And a crisis in Suez brings great power rivalry to the Middle East. Russia's successful launching of the first Earth satellite starts a race for supremacy in outer space and increases fears of a nuclear attack. American policy continues to be based on containment, but also on keeping periodic crises from escalating into great power confrontations. Above all, it seeks to avoid a third world war. It is supported by a bipartisan majority of the Congress and the American public. President Eisenhower's efforts to negotiate a reduction in East-West tensions finally lead to a visit by Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev to the United States but end when an American spy plane is shot down over the Soviet Union. As the 60s begin, there are new confrontations in Africa and at the United Nations. An American effort to overthrow Cuban Premier Fidel Castro is a disaster, and President Kennedy accepts responsibility. A summit meeting in Vienna fails to avoid another crisis in Berlin. The communists build a wall to stop the flow of refugees to the West. October 22nd, 1962. President Kennedy confirms reports that the Soviet Union is installing missiles with nuclear warheads in Cuba. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound to Cuba, from whatever nation or port, Will they found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back? It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. October 28th, seven days after Kennedy's announcement, Khrushchev agrees to dismantle the missiles and withdraw them from Cuba. The crisis is over. Both sides have faced squarely the possibility of nuclear war, and neither side liked it. By June of 1963, a hotline has been installed between Washington and Moscow. And in August, a treaty banning all nuclear weapons testing above ground and limiting underground tests is signed. Two months later, President Kennedy is dead. His assassination shocks the nation, but it is seen as an isolated event. No one can predict it is the beginning of a series of assassinations and domestic and international crises which will erode the confidence of Americans in themselves and their government. There are many causes, but one looms above all others. Vietnam. At the time of Kennedy's assassination, there were 16,000 American military advisors in Vietnam, and some Americans already had been killed. By 1968, there will be nearly half a million American troops there. Today, nearly all Americans have drawn their own conclusions about Vietnam, and it is too soon to relive with any objectivity the angry and sometimes violent confrontations and debates which preoccupied the country for a decade or more. But some things are obvious. Vietnam became the longest war the United States ever fought, 
and the most divisive period in American history since the Civil War. Gone was the foreign policy consensus which had characterized most of the post-war period. Do not consider uh, the struggle in Vietnam uh, between the Viet Cong and Saigon a civil war? We can't accept it. Gone, too, was bipartisan congressional support. The war set off an era of conflict between Congress and the executive branch. West Germany would go after East Germany. This would not be looked upon as just a family affair among Germans. March 31st, 1968. An embattled President Johnson makes an historic announcement. I shall not seek, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Johnson has rejected any further escalation of the war, and six weeks later he sends Ambassador Averill Harriman to Paris to begin negotiations for peace. For a brief moment, there is hope, but then the talks degenerate into a procedural wrangle. The war has become such a national preoccupation that it tends to obscure other important developments in world affairs. Since the early 1960s, a bitter rivalry between China and the Soviet Union has been apparent. There are periodic border clashes over disputed territory, and each side is using language against the other, equal to the worst excesses of the Cold War. Clearly, if the communist world ever was monolithic, it is no more. There also have been changes in the Western alliance. France has withdrawn its forces from NATO, and a number of Western European nations have joined together to form the common market. Together, they are now one of the world's principal economic powers. Japan also has achieved an economic miracle. The foundations for Japanese recovery and economic growth were laid during the American occupation after World War II. Now Japan is one of the major trading nations of the world. Equally dramatic are the changes in the non-aligned world, the third world, as it is now called. During the 60s, almost all of the remaining colonies in the third world became independent and joined the United Nations, changing the character of the world organization and particularly the General Assembly a truly global community is beginning to emerge. American aid to the developing nations now has some success stories to tell. Places where foreign aid has been so effective it could be terminated. Industrial and agricultural production have also increased dramatically in other countries receiving aid. But unfortunately, so have birth rates. In the years ahead, Aid will concentrate its efforts on human needs, food and nutrition, population and health, education, and human resources development. By the late 1960s, it became apparent that for all practical purposes, the Soviet Union had achieved a kind of rough parity with the United States in nuclear weapons. The strategic superiority America enjoyed during the Cuban Missile Crisis is gone and each side has developed the capacity to destroy civilization. In 1967, the U.S. proposed negotiations to limit strategic arms, but preliminary discussions were suspended when Soviet tanks invaded Czechoslovakia. July 20th, 1969. The world's attention is riveted by the incredible spectacle of men landing on the moon. The moon flights provide man with his first view of planet Earth, a powerful reminder of the growing interdependence of all nations. Later that year, the United States begins withdrawing its troops from Vietnam. By April 1970, over 90,000 American soldiers have come home, and 150,000 more are scheduled to leave. Then, President Nixon announces American and South Vietnamese forces have entered Cambodia. Although Nixon says they will withdraw within 60 days, the action sets off the angriest demonstrations of the war. By now, Vietnam is nothing less than a traumatic experience for most Americans. They are shocked by the disorders at home, stunned by American atrocities at Milai, 
and horrified when demonstrators at Kent State University are shot and killed. January 1972. Nixon discloses that Henry Kissinger, then his special assistant for national security affairs, has been meeting since 1969 with North Vietnamese negotiators in Paris in an effort to end the war. The 1970s bring many shifts in U.S. policy to reflect the world's new realities, and none is more dramatic than the sudden reversal of relations with China. The United States ends its ban on American travel to China, and soon private American citizens are invited there. Nonetheless, the news that Kissinger has arranged a presidential visit in 1972 comes as a complete surprise, and the visit itself is a watershed event in relations between the two nations. On many issues which divide them, the two sides agree to disagree. But nearly two decades of frozen hostility are over. Before long, each country will have a liaison office in the other's capital. Months later, an American president arrives in the Soviet Union for the first time since World War II. The highlight of Nixon's visit is the signing of the first strategic arms limitation agreement between the two nations. Other agreements to promote cooperation and reduce tensions also are signed, and they arrange early ratification of a four-power agreement on Berlin, designed to put an end to the periodic crises there. West German Chancellor Willy Brandt signs a series of treaties normalizing relations with his neighbors to the east. Eventually, there will be an east-west conference on European security and cooperation. The following year, Soviet party chief Brezhnev visits Washington. It is another step in the process begun by Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy and Johnson to gradually build areas of agreement between the two superpowers. There are serious disputes about some issues, particularly trade and human rights but few want to return to the angry days of the Cold War. January 23, 1973. After renewed heavy bombing of North Vietnam has produced another bitter national debate, a series of peace agreements are initialed in Paris. The agreements provide for the withdrawal of the last American troops in Vietnam and the release of all Americans who are prisoners of war. Lieutenant Commander Alcorn. Their return is still not the end of the agony in Indochina, and later in the year, Congress passes the War Powers Resolution over a presidential veto. The resolution limits the president's authority to commit American forces to combat. It is part of the gradual process of establishing a new equilibrium between Congress and the executive branch. During the following year, U.S. policymakers moved to strengthen relations with America's friends and allies. In Latin America, the U.S. has been criticized for its policies in the Dominican Republic, Chile, and elsewhere. At a meeting of Latin American foreign ministers in Mexico, Secretary of State Kissinger pledges the United States will do its utmost to settle outstanding problems, and cites Panama as an example. In Panama, the 70-year-old treaty for American use of the Panama Canal Zone has become a political issue. There are periodic riots and at one point, diplomatic relations were broken. Now the two nations seek to negotiate a new treaty which will satisfy legitimate Panamanian complaints while protecting American rights and the security of the canal. November 1974. After the Watergate scandals forced President Nixon to resign, President Ford goes to the Soviet Union, where he meets with Russia's leaders near Vladivostok. They agree on the principles for additional strategic arms negotiations, which would put a ceiling on the arms race for the first time in history and set the stage for reductions in nuclear stockpiles. 1975. The last act of the Vietnam drama unfolds in Indochina. Enemy forces defeat the anti-communist governments of South Vietnam and Cambodia. Americans are forced to flee their embassies and make a desperate effort to take some of their most loyal allies with them. It is over. The greatest challenge of creativity, as I see it, lies ahead. We, of course, 
are saddened indeed by the events in Indochina. But these events, tragic as they are, portend neither the end of the world nor of America's leadership in the world. The greatest threat to peace now lies in the Middle East. In 1973, the fourth major war in the Middle East engulfed the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights. Israel suffered severe casualties and losses of military equipment, but eventually managed to go on the offensive. The United States airlifted nearly 23,000 tons of military supplies to Israel to replace its war losses. The Middle East has become a major source of oil for the industrialized world. Now the Arab oil-producing nations institute a temporary boycott against them, creating an economic crisis in Europe and Japan, and severe shortages of gasoline and other petroleum products in the United States. The other major oil-producing countries join them in a dramatic increase in the price of oil. Secretary of State Kissinger takes the lead in seeking a way to end the crisis, the beginning of a long personal involvement in Middle Eastern diplomacy. Kissinger negotiates an agreement between Israel and Egypt to disengage their forces along the Suez Canal. He speaks of a more even-handed policy in the Middle East and pursues a step-by-step -step approach to negotiations, believing that an attempt to solve all problems at once would surely fail. Later, he negotiates a disengagement agreement on the Syrian front as well, and another agreement between Egypt and Israel on the Sinai Peninsula, which raises hopes that a final settlement may be possible there. But the danger of a new Middle East war remains ever-present. In February 1974, the United States hosts an energy conference of the largest oil-consuming nations. Some proclaim the conference a failure, but in fact, it is the start of a new era of cooperation among the industrialized democracies. In the years ahead, they work together on various measures to avoid or deal with another embargo, and to consider the overall problems of natural resources with the producing nations. The oil embargo brought home to every American the fact that all nations are now economically interdependent. But the poorest nations are the ones who suffer the most from the continuing high price of oil. And they are already burdened by food and population crises that now have become priority global issues. The population of the world has risen to over 4 billion people, twice what it was 45 years ago. Between 300 and 500 million do not get enough food. Up to 800 million are poorly nourished. One of every five children dies before the age of five. Experts predict that in the next 35 years, the population of the world will double again. Kissinger tells the United Nations, improving the quality of human life has become a universal political demand, a technical pop, and a moral imperative. History does not arrange itself neatly to fit bicentennial anniversaries. As America approached its 200th birthday, there were other crises abroad and controversies at home. And as usual, more questions than answers. But the nation had set a new course for the post-Vietnam era, a course designed to strengthen its bonds with friends and allies, to reduce tensions with potential adversaries, limit strategic arms and halt the spread of nuclear weapons and to face the stern challenges of an interdependent world. For this much is certain. We are all fellow passengers on spaceship Earth. We must learn to live together or our divisions will destroy us. We are in an age of great danger and great opportunity. One of those rare moments when it is possible to shape the future.